What are those? <laughs> I think gate is. <laughs> gate is killing us? Yes. <laughs> okay, then we'll keep the uh, introduction short. So let people trickle in. And uh, it's a welcome uh, to uh, Dr. Ramistra. So, yes. Uh, Prajit Dhara, he is at the. Um, He's doing PhD with uh, Professor Seika Guha at the University of Arizona, and he is focusing on the architectures and design, uh, architecture design and performance evaluation of practical entanglement distribution schemes. Um, the research explores discrete variables and continuous variables of information processing and communication schemes. So, Rajit, all yours, get started. Thank you, Professor Ghosh, for that uh, uh, introduction, and thanks to the team for enabling my visit over here. It's a pleasure and a great experience to give a talk at IIC. Uh, so, as Professor Ghosh mentioned, I'm a fourth year PhD student in the group of uh, Professor Saikat Guha. The official name is Quantum Photonic Applications Group, but uh, yeah, uh, I'll only be talking about my research to know about my group's research. I think we'll need 20 such talks because everybody does something different. Uh, I'm part of the Center for Quantum Networks, which is uh, NSF-funded research center based at the University of Arizona. I'll give you a glimpse of what we do there. Uh, and uh, for today's talk, uh, this, is my, this is my rough outline of what I wanted to do. Uh, I, I will start with a quick refresher on quantum states, operations, and measurements, even though these are usually things we all know, but I feel I find that even within physicists, uh, there's sometimes uh, misunderstandings of what a certain terminology means. So as somebody who's been trained in quantum information theory, I wanted to give you my, my perspective of what these terms are. Uh, then quick uh, look through what entanglement can be used as a resource for by showing you what a very simplistic protocol known as Eckert 91 can do in terms of uh, entanglement being useful for quantum communication. And then I'll move to the bulk of my talk where I'll uh, talk about quantum network link modeling, what quantum links look like, what are their architectures, what hardware components go in them, uh, and how do we actually go ahead and build their models. And finally, I'll give a very brief overview on some architecture performances and trade-offs for some practical quantum links that we have been thinking about at our center and also people have been uh, you know, doing experiments on throughout the world. So without further ado, I'll just stick to this. Uh, so uh, refraction on quantum states, when you have a complete knowledge of some quantum state, we call it a pure state psi. Uh, the state itself is generally uh, computationally something that can be treated as a column vector, it's unit norm and it's uh, conjugate or uh, the bra in the Dirac notation is something that is a unit norm row vector and your unit norm condition or your normalization condition mod psi squared integrated over all three variables equal to one is given as outer product psi psi, sorry inner product psi psi equal to one. Uh, so for quantum information processing the basic term that we care about is a qubit which is usually <laughs> a kind of two level system so the state psi can be written as alpha zero plus beta one, uh, zero and one are then orthonormal terms. So then you can choose the representation in which zero and one following our uh, definition that they must be column vectors are one zero and zero one. Uh, that gives us the orthogonality condition automatically. And then any arbitrary term can be written as this column vector alpha beta, where alpha and beta are both uh, generally complex numbers. And your unit term condition converts to mod alpha squared plus mod beta squared equal to one. Uh, that's how you get alpha beta and you can also choose a different orthonormal basis for representing your state. So if I chose the spaces 0 plus 1 by square root of 2 and 0 minus 1 by square root of 2, they're still orthonormal to each other but now you have different superpositions that are possible. Uh, what, will, what is generally covered later on is 
What do we do when we have imperfect knowledge of the quantum state? Well, we can't write it as a pure state anymore. We have to think of it in terms of the density operator or it's in a finite basis, a density matrix. And in general, they are statistical mixtures of different pure states. Uh, moving on to multi qubit states, two quantum systems can be you know, jointly represented by a tensor product state. Uh, the procedure is very straightforward. You take two states and you find out the uh, Kronecker product in the either the matrix notation or you write out the tensor product in your abstract notation. And any term such as one one over here just means the system is in system A is in one and system B is in one two. What you now have is special two qubit states, which are the entangled states, where you cannot represent them as product states. And this is what is of most interest for any kind of quantum communication. Specifically, considering a state of the form 0, 0 plus 1, 1, this is still a valid quantum state, except I can no longer write it as some alpha 0, 8 plus beta 1, 8 tensor with comma B 0, B, and that is 1, B. Uh, so, in certain sense, this is a kind of state where measuring one qubit or measuring one system information uh, influences the information in the other measurement. Uh, and uh, an entangled state can be represented in other basis and uh, there are some theorems which shows that if it's a maximally entangled state, and we'll come to what that means later on, uh, in any orthonormal basis, they should be, be maximally entangled. Uh, just your representation shouldn't change your entanglement quantity or you know, quantification in the system. Uh, finally, the thing we need to know is state measurements. Again, how you define your states where through a set of unit norm vectors that, that you constructed an orthonormal basis out of, or information theoretic perspective on what measurement mean. You just take a set of unit norm vectors that form a complete orthonormal basis. And if you take the vectors to be some set W sub K, and each of these elements are pairwise, you know, orthonormal to each other, and you construct the projectors where you take the outer products of these states, uh, meaning if these were column vectors, then the outer product would be matrices. Uh, then you can ask the Question, what is the probability that state is measured in the state WK? And it's simply given by that overlap over here. And as we all know, measurement collapses the system from multiple possible outcomes to one possible outcome. So this is all trivial from here on that if I take a state alpha zero plus beta one, I get these probabilities of measuring zero and one. And if I chose some other basis of measurement, say plus and minus, as we took as a trivial other example, and I chose this other basis of measurement, uh, then I get the probabilities of outcome uh, in general. So, given all that information, how do we use entanglement? We know that the entangled state is something that cannot be written as a tensor product. So, let's consider the following case. We have two parties, Alice and Bob. Uh, Bob is in B. Bob is B over here. Oh, sorry about that. And they are trying to talk to each other over an unsecured channel, meaning they do not know if there are any eavesdroppers or not. They want to share secrets on this channel. But at the same time, they really don't want to divulge uh, anything more than they need to to get to that secret. So how does uh, how does Eckert 91, a famous QKD protocol, help us in sharing secrets? Well, if we have the communicating parties and additionally a source of entanglement and any kind of classical communication that it need not be secured, Eckert 91 says that if we have the entanglement source at some midpoint, uh, not geometrically, but let's say there's somebody sending entanglement to both Alice and Bob, and it can send a stream of entangled states, and for the sake of this protocol, let's assume these states are perfectly sent to Alice and Bob, then Alice and Bob receive, say, state 0, 0, plus 1, 1, which can be written in two ways. Now, all we ask from Alice and Bob is that they choose randomly at their locations by tossing a fair coin, uh, whether they want to choose, uh, you know, measure the system in the zero one basis or the plus minus basis. And they don't need to communicate this to each other at the very beginning. Alice and Bob just receive a stream of bits perfectly and they do this measurement repeatedly independently. So at the end of everything, they will talk to each other on the phone through this unsecured channel, but they won't share their information. Uh, this is uh, what I'm going to show what will happen now. So let's say Alice and Bob do this measurement and they choose the basis uh, independently. Here are like eight possible trials where Alice chooses a measurement basis and Bob chooses a measurement basis, and Alice and Bob will get outcomes accordingly. 
Now, what we know is that if the measurement bases are the same, meaning Alice chose 0, 1 and Bob chose 0, 1 and this as well, because of the perfect correlation that we have in the variables or their quantum states, they'll get the same outcome. If they choose something different, then it projects, uh, let's say Alice chose 0, 1, she measured it, she got a 0, which means Bob must be 0, but then Bob chose plus or minus. Uh, 0 is plus, the state plus plus minus by square root of 2, meaning Bob is now going to get the outcome plus or minus with an equal probability of 50%, meaning Bob's outcome is going to be completely random if they didn't concur on their measurement. So they do this independently. 50% uh, of the time they will measure in the same basis because there are two bases and four possible combinations. Uh, then they talk over the phone and share the basis outcomes. They just tell each other, this is the basis that I use. They don't need to tell which outcome they got. They just tell each other, this is what uh, basis I was doing for the slot number one, slot number two, and so on and so forth. Uh, what we'll see is that at the very end, if they only keep the bits that they agreed that they concurred in the measurement of, then they'll get perfectly correlated bits. And this is a shared secret that is protected by the laws of physics. If there's an eavesdropper, uh, let's say, let's call him Eve, Eve is going to you know, project uh, the system in one of these bases, but then if they, if Alice and Bob don't concur, uh, they won't be able to you know, ever uh, match, which will expose the fact that there's an eavesdropper to the channel. So uh, this is also a way to find out if there's uh, any listener in the ideology. Uh, there's a lot of security proofs and whatnot for a non-ideal regime and practical distribution. But this is hopefully enough to motivate why uh, quantum entanglement is useful. And I'm suspecting a lot of you are already familiar with this. So uh, moving on to the meat of the talk, uh, my interest is in quantum network link modeling. So what is my motivation? Uh, a prototype quantum network when we have you know a true network and not just one to one links will be comprised of multiple different parties marked by user one you know u1 through u4 over here connected through various different types of quantum links not just in terms of the length of those links or what the links choose to set up are, are they doing qkd are they just generating entanglement are they doing something like distributed quantum computing but also the type of links that they'll have and uh, the specific types of links have to be informed by uh, first the theoretical calculations of what is the theory best that you can achieve with them. And then finally, somebody has to do the experiment and tell us that, okay, no, I'm only able to get 80% of what you promised. Um, and the vision for the quantum internet is that, you know, you take all, a lot of such small networks and then you connect them on a bigger network and then you just do a tangent distribution over variety of different quantum memories or quantum systems. Uh, the state of the art for this, however, is limited to a few node demonstrations, uh, most famously the three node demonstration from TU Delft uh, two years ago, uh, three years ago now, and uh, more recently, just last year, at the metropolitan scale over three different labs by Harvard and AWS. Uh, this paper is still in archive, but yeah, I suspect this should also be in science or nature. So. Uh, the burning need in this field right now is develop some physics motivated models for the smallest unit of future networks and then you know build from that and that's what my research has been focused on and that's what our lab has been trying to do and we don't specifically limit ourselves to one specific configuration or one type of experiment but we try to do our studies at the most generalized scale. so the focus is on generalized system level studies for optimized network development uh, and why quantum upgrade the internet? Well, uh, with entanglement, you can do something uh, that goes beyond simple, uh, you know, very large baseline interferometry with radio telescope, but you can do VLBI with optical telescopes. Uh, you can enhance your deep space communication capabilities by pushing how many bits you can send reliably over an extremely high loss channel. Uh, you can ensure private access to quantum computing on the cloud where uh, you can log onto a quantum computer without the service providers, say IBM or AWS or whoever has a quantum computer knowing what quantum computing you're doing. Uh, and at the physicist's uh, end of interest, uh, you can do interesting experiments on entanglement assisted sensing and tomography, uh, which surprisingly also has applications in biology and many other things related to high sensitivity 
non-invasive techniques. And finally, uh, for the engineers, you can do something like entanglement assisted communications where you can enhance your communication rate or you know, enhance the security of your system just through entanglement. Uh, and the uh, NSF Center for Quantum Networks, which I'm a part of and my advisor is the director of, is trying to solve a bunch of these problems. We are based out of four institutes and this is just a sneak peek of what we are interested in. Uh, so, for uh, quantum network, uh, the only reliable or the only known way to send information over large distances is light. And we are going to talk about photonics based uh, quantum networks here. And for that, we have to first ask how do I encode a qubit in the photon? Uh, the easiest way to do this is to simply say that the presence or absence of a photon in a single optical mode are the logical qubit states. So by zero bar, which is the zero logical qubit, and the one logical state, or the vacuum state and the single photon Fox state respectively, or I can do something like a dual real encoding where I can think of the same presence of a single photon in one of two orthogonal modes as the logical states. Uh, this is more familiar to people in terms of polarization encoding, where it's horizontal or vertical. This is similar rotation, just to keep it general, I don't write H or V or you know, early late or you know, uh, T, D, M, and yada, yada, yada. I think of this as one photon in one mode and the orthogonal state is one photon in the other. And you can also have other more so-called exotic encodings uh, based on phase space distributions. Uh, the famous Schrodinger CAT basis and the very you know, up and coming GKP basis encodings are also possible uh, ways to encode a single qubit in a single mode. But uh, these are you know, a little bit out, far out in the future to deploy on quantum networks, uh, but just as an exposure. Uh, finally, the things that we generally care about is how do I measure the quality of entanglement or quality of my protocol in terms of what I can achieve. Sure, the best thing to do is first ask what is the rate, but you also have to ask what is the rate at which I'm delivering faithful entanglement. The most common one that people use is fidelity. And it's as its name suggests, it's the measure of state similarity to a target state. Your target state is usually a pure state, psi t, but you can also choose a mixed state as a target state, although the last thing is very rarely done. And you have either a pure realized state or some mixed realized state. And fidelity is some kind of overlap integral measurement. Uh, you generally denote this by the symbol F rho psi t. And for most quantum communication protocols, you will evaluate this quantity for some general bipartite state rho AB that your protocol generates with the target bell state psi plus or minus or what have uh, The information theoretic end, however, fidelity is only good when your fidelity is close to one. Fidelity being not close to one doesn't mean anything. If your fidelity is close to 50%, even classically correlated states have fidelity 50% with their bell states. So uh, going away from fidelity of one uh, more and more so means <coughs> less about your entanglement quantity. Uh, what do, as information theorists like to do, they want to quantify some uh, asymptotic quantity. Uh, in case of entanglement distribution, uh, there's this quantity called the distillable entanglement, which one can think of as the maximum number of bell states that can be distilled by some ideal quantum computer if I give it the same copy row A B infinite number of times. Meaning this is a purely information theorist uh, perspective, meaning that given some arbitrary protocol and given arbitrarily complicated hardware and some uh, you know lossless way to do this, given a state row A B, I can get to or given one copy of it, I can get to a fractional value, or given you know infinite copy of it, I'll get to an asymptotic fraction, which is uh, the distributed entanglement. Distributed entanglement for a state is always upper bounded by one, as you can't do better than one EBIT per you know state generated, uh, unless you have high dimensional encodings, of course, but let's stick to qubits. And it's denoted by ED of rho AB. As with all, all information theory quantities, uh, it's generally hard to evaluate for any arbitrary state. So we usually lower bound it by saying there's an achievable lower bound I of rho AB, which is given by this hashing bound quantity defined as you know a maximum of two marginal binary entries. 
uh, I flow AB is strictly less than or equal to EDF flow AB. So this is we can always reach I flow AB through a protocol known as a hashing protocol. Uh, the symbols over here, S of row A uh, is the random entropy, and row A and row B are partial traces of the system. Uh, the upper bounds to ED can also be derived. The upper bounds are just uh, good ways to get uh, agreement on what the true discriminant entanglement must be, or what is the best you can do with it. But these are also usually harder to evaluate, so we'll stick to evaluating uh, hashing bounds because they already involve these uh, entities. Now, moving to the actual architectures, uh, and this is, you know, and one can ask the question, how, can, how many ways there are to send uh, information to two parties? Well, uh, the analog that does not exist in classical communication is the midpoint swap link, where we assume that two parties, Alice and Bob, uh, now I remove the pictures and I say that they're arbitrary quantum memories, uh, these purple circles that can send photonic qubits to a midpoint, uh, there's some in general optical loss channel that's going on. Let's say that for, for the sake of the first discussion, let's say that they are pure loss and there's no noise on them. And at the midpoint, Charlie can uh, swap entanglement, meaning Alice's memory and Alice's photonic qubit is entangled. Bob's uh, quantum memory and Bob's photonic qubit is entangled. Charlie swaps the entanglement between photonic qubit coming from both sides. So then quantum memory and Alice and quantum memory and Bob are entangled to one another. This is the, the midpoint swap link, and the classical overhead is that you need two-way classical communications from Charlie to Alison Bob. Alison Bob need to let Charlie know that uh, there are entangled photons coming, so that Charlie can uh, start swapping, and Charlie needs to know Alison Bob whether a swap has succeeded or not. Uh, the requirements usually for this is some source of photon matter entanglement, or as is you know easily uh, mentionable, point of memories that can emit photons. Uh, some optical transmission channel uh, for practical considerations, any mode and frequency conversion to maximize your transmission efficiency or minimize loss in the channel overall. And finally, the entanglement swapping circuit for uh, Charlie at the midpoint, which comprises of detectors and beam splitters. The other protocol, which is you know most analogous to classical communication, and we call it midpoint source, is you have Charlie who generates entanglement in the midpoint, very similar to how Eckert 91 was done, sends the entangled pair to Alice and Bob, and instead of proves loss channels, of course, and instead of measuring Alice and Bob, load the photons onto their memories. How they load it is another question that I hope to you know, give you some uh, insights into one possible technique to do it, but this is the uh, uh, generalized model of how it looks like. Uh, the requirements here are slightly different. Uh, both in terms of the classical overhead, where you not only need classical communications from Charlie to Alice and Bob, letting them know that they have to expect photons, but Alice and Bob have to reconcile between, with, between each other that they have indeed received entangled photons at the time that, uh, at the same time, otherwise the protocol doesn't succeed. Uh, the requirements here are not sources of matter photon entanglement, but rather entangled photonic qubits. Uh, and how you implement them depends on the choice of your encoding of these photonic qubits. Uh, the transmission channels, more frequency conversion, and now instead of quantum memories that emit photons, quantum memories that can load photons through a direct absorption, so to speak, or a helical swap that can do the load. Uh, given all that, uh, in details of the link architectures, the overall open you know, requirements can be summarized as follows. In your entanglement sources, you either have sources of entanglement photon qubit pairs, meaning photon uh, photon entangled, the photon generated by some system. You mean, uh, uh, are these heraldic sources that you require or any random sources? Uh, that's a good question. So you usually can start a protocol with a random source, but it always is nice to have a heraldic source. And uh, we have actually done some research on heralded sources that I'll be mentioning quite soon. Yeah. Uh, and additionally, for the first step of protocol, you need entanglement between quantum memory and a photon. You can do this in a staggered way. You can generate photon photon entanglement and then entangle your quantum memory and whatnot. But uh, let's say that you know that is a subset of the first technique that we do. Uh, to have a quantum memory that can emit a photon entangled to it is 
something that's different than just photonic qubits being generated in an entangled fashion. Uh, in your quantum memories, uh, you need memories that can load a photonic qubit. And again, quantum memories that emit entangled photonic qubits. Uh, more, more frequency conversion uh, requirements are also strict because uh, optical fiber is optimized to operate in specific bands of the spectrum. You cannot send visible light uh, at the extremely low loss values that make optical fiber so useful, at least on commercial fiber. And if you want to use free space transmission, you need to choose optimal modes to do this. And you know, free space transmission is limited by line of sight and all the other things that play the free space transmission. The last two points are something I'll skip for today's talk. Uh, there are better people talk about this than me. And uh, uh, yeah, they, they are a completely different requirement in terms of expertise to you know, go into that. Uh, however, on the fourth point, I'm happy to talk with people about what are the optimal modes because we've got some theory. Uh, so the first uh, section on this is photonic entanglement sources and uh, the most famous one, the one that, you know, uh, kind of essentially won the Nobel Prize last year, uh, not in the form that I'm going to show, but in a similar form, is the SKDC source of entanglement. Specifically, if we choose the dual rail encoding, what we want is the SPDC source of polarization in tangled qubits. Uh, here are shown as a you know, green box, or black box. The SPDC source generates theoretically a quantum state, which is given as follows. It's a combination of two two modes squeeze vacuum states, or to make the make it more clear, uh, it is parameterized by one parameter, which is the mean photon number per mode, which is tuned by the pump power, meaning uh, the pump laser that drives your dump conversion process will influence how many mean photons you have per mode. But if I write it down, if I write down the summation after the first three terms, I'll see that with the probability P0, I have vacuum, which corresponds to the dump conversion process not succeeding. Probability P1, I have the bell pair in the dual rail basis. And probability P2, I have the two pair terms, which are noise terms. And this is a theoretical model, but this matches very well with a lot of experimental uh, demonstrations of entanglement sources. Specifically, uh, this model was kind of, uh, I would say, uh, inspired by the source built by Paul Puyat et al. in this very famous paper from 1993, I think. And then uh, Koch and Brownstein did experiments on teleportation with a similar source that you know match very well with this model of the source. Uh, just to clear, just to show you why I call this the bell pair. In the polarization entangled basis, uh, one zero can be treated as H and zero one can be V, or vice versa. There is no preference to which uh, term you choose to write it down. So then, one zero zero one plus zero one one zero is nothing but H V plus V H. So and this measures some horizontal bob nodes, it's going to be vertical, and vice versa. The problem with the source, as as according to the uh, question posed by Professor Ghosh is that the source is free running, meaning every time you know I, a laser pulse hits the source, and this is just a theoretical model, but it actually comprises of down converters and crystals. The quantum state emitted by it is this superposition. It isn't a statistical mixture of these terms, it's a superposition because you'll see interference between these terms if you choose to do an interference experiment, meaning I do not know in what time slot I'm going to detect a vacuum, which is useless because I'm not sending any photons. I do not know at what time slot I'll detect a bell pair, and when I will detect the two pair terms, uh, in the ideal scenario when you had no loss, you can tell a point between them because uh, if you have anything more than one photon, it's a failure, throw it out. You don't get a photon, uh, then that's a failure. You get a bell pair all the time, but you have any loss, two pair terms, which when you know they lose a single photon, show up as one photon terms yeah. and that is noise because they do not carry any amount of entanglement but Alice and Bob will declare aha I have received one photon each uh, and your you know protocol is already ruined because uh, you're not truly generating entanglement. Uh, the experimental and the theoretical way to treat this system is to operate in an extremely low mean photon number per mode regime. Uh, NS of 0.2 is already large but this model is true up to NS of 0.2, but usually the typical value of mean photon number per mode corresponding to experimental 
implementations is about 10 power minus 3. And you can already see by you know just doing back of the envelope calculations that that means your P1 term is incredibly small compared to your P0 term, meaning very rarely do you get well pairs. What about the efficiency of the crystals? You have that in what does it matter? Uh, the efficiency of the crystal actually translates into your NS. So, uh, putting in all those terms are, are, are dumped into NS. Exactly. So, uh, my photon not getting down converted is the yeah. same as me down converting and losing the photons within the crystal. Right. So, they will all come down to vacuum. But that's a good question. A more practical model uh, is to, you know, think of it as an ideal source and then put a loss at the end of it. Uh, but you know that in, in terms of network analysis, I, a loss within the crystal and loss and the network is indiscernible to me, so I can treat it as a total loss term. So, but that's not going to be the noise. No? I mean, your efficiency is reducing the overall number, mm -hmm. but the one which is the two pair term becoming uh, losing photon and becoming mm -hmm. effectively a bell pair is essentially a noise. Yes. Right. So, but that's different from efficiency. I mean, is that something which I would say? Ah, I see, I see. Okay, so, right. So, your NS is indeed uh, a term that encompasses all your efficiency and heredity. So, right. NS, uh, if you work out the complete integral, will have the mode overlap, uh, your time mismatch, and upon that in it. So, uh, I have to correct my previous statement that I cannot treat it the same as loss. It goes into how NS is described in terms of the pump power and whatnot, but uh, that would vary actually from experiment to experiment and how you build your source. Uh, thank you. Uh, but again, whatever we do, this is not going to be heralded, meaning I'll always have to live with the superposition term. And I cannot then drive NS too high because then I'll, I'm more likely to lose two pair terms and then get a noise in it. So how do I make this heralded? Uh, what Sometimes what we do is they, they, they use an FPDC polarization source and they detect one end of it, and that way they can get a heralded single photon up to the efficiency of your detecting detector, of course. Uh, but then they take those single photons and do some linear optical uh, circuitry or additional nonlinearities to generate entanglement between those heralded single photons. Uh, we took a different approach in our theoretical uh, study, at least. When we said that we already have entanglement here, why don't we consider two of these sources, uh, two SPDC sources, and I do a bell state measurement in between them locally. Uh, when I do a bell state measurement between them locally, if my detectors are not noisy, ideally, every time I have a bell pair from the first source and bell pair from the second source, I will do a successful entanglement swap, which is heralded, by the way. I know when it has succeeded. And when I know it has succeeded, I will herald a term which is ideally the bell pair at the very end. Well, when we did the analysis for this, we actually saw that it's true, you do get the ideal bell pair term, but because of the bell state measurement being uh, you know, path erasure kind of experiment or path erasure kind of process, you cannot tell apart between the terms where both source one and source two have sent one photon each. And source one and source two have you know each sent zero and two or two and zero photons. The path erasure process uh, doesn't discern between <coughs> those two. So the output state M, given a uh, success trigger, is a superposition now of the bell pair that you want and some other entangled term. This is still entangled, but not in the basis that you care about. Well, that's uh, you know that's 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 not nice because. You want to get only this term, but for realistic quantum uh, networking protocols, you can you always need to do some kind of measurement at the end. You're not just going to send these states and you know this let those states be. Alice and Bob are going to try and load these states into memories or you know measure them at the very least to do QKD. Now the nice thing about this term is that if I sorry if I have the case that uh, Alice and Bob are doing measurements at the very end. If uh, Alice and Bob both receive their photons, they either both receive one photon, or we only have the case where Alice will never receive a photon, Bob will receive two photons or one photon. So in the case or in the scenario when they reconcile with each other, Alice and Bob are never going to both say, aha, I re received one photon each, but they actually haven't generated entanglement. Well, that, that argument breaks down when they have noise and everything, but 
uh, let's for the sake of the first argument say that there is no noise in the system, which simply means that I, if I post select on the state having Alice and Bob having one photon and only one photon, I can throw away these terms because Alice and Bob will never get a single photon each, uh, regardless of whether this term goes through loss or not, because there is no photon in one party's uh, pair of modes to begin with. So if I have an ideal quantum memory at the end, and this is a heralded source, uh, why don't I think of the protocol as I have M of these sources, uh, meaning I, they can each succeed maybe one in one million times, but I can multiplex how many ever I want. I have a controller which takes the signal or the heralding trigger out of it, runs a computer which switches out photons as I require it, and then if I think of the receivers as ideal quantum memories, then I can always tell uh, when I receive an entangled photon, uh, modulo the channel loss and everything in the system. The problem is that to get near unity entanglement efficiency, when I assume that Alice and Bob are sitting right at the source, meaning ideal quantum memories are just at the person generating entanglement, uh, because of the mean photon number requirement, this multiplexing size is huge. It's 10 power 4. Uh, and one of these experiments takes an optical table, so you don't usually want to build 10,000 of these in your lab. Uh, you also have a strict requirement on your switching loss. Your per switch loss is less than one, has to be less than 1.5 dB for this multiplexing to work. And overall, any loss in your system will reduce the probability of success, which means I drive up my multiplexing rate, uh, or I can you know, choose to operate at a lower probability of success for a higher quality state. We analyzed this in our paper here, and uh, we, you know, kind of thought, well, this is just a theoretical proposal. Nobody's going to build 10,000 sources. Uh, that's it. Uh, but then our collaborator uh, at MIT, Dirk England, said, well, you don't actually have to build uh, spatially dis distinct sources. You can choose to do a broadband uh, down conversion process and do your heralding in the frequency bit, meaning I. Not, I don't. I don't think of my multiplexing in terms of independent 10,000 sources. I just say that I have down conversion processes, uh, which are broadband. But when I do my measurement, I measure those photons. I do the well state measurement or the entanglement swapping over frequency bits. Now, because of the virtue of uh, down conversion and the fundamental tenets of down conversion being uh, frequency, oh, sorry, energy conservation and momentum conservation. When I detect photons in different frequency bits over here, I not only know that there are corresponding you know, complementary photons in the undetected modes, I also know at which frequency they exist. Meaning, uh, using spectrally demultiplex channels uh, to do my measurement over here, not only saves me the trouble of having to build 10,000 separate sources, I can also tell you which frequencies these photons come out at. So this was a theoretical proposal that we uh, came up with uh, Kevin Chen, uh, my collaborator, uh, who's a student of, who's a student of Kirk England, and I came up with this idea uh, where you can take some kind of uh, SPDC crystal with a one terahertz phase matching bandwidth, uh, do detection over 12.5 gigahertz channels, which is 80 channels. And since frequency multiplexing is near lossless, that's a hand wavy statement, but let's say that it's near lossless. Even with this, you can get to a source which is uh, which generates entangled pairs almost every time that you do. Again, heralding gives you a triggering signal for uh, what uh, the end party will receive, and you also get which frequency bin information. And the source generated is the same because uh, instead of now entanglement just being over polarization, I'll have entanglement over different frequencies. Uh, so this is just the four into sources. Uh, we with this extension of our heralded multiplex source proposal, we can now have a scalable way to do entanglement generation in a heralded fashion. Uh, how about the quantum memories? Well, uh, the quantum memories that we are most familiar with and most uh, fond of are uh, these group four vacancies in diamonds. These are the relatively new cousins of the nitrogen vacancy in diamond, which has been studied to great depth. Uh, but the group four vacancies in diamond are slightly different. Specifically, if I take the diamond lattice and in the principle one 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 direction, 
I remove two carbon atoms and I choose an uh, atom in the same uh, group of as carbon, but you know, in a different period. Uh, it's slightly larger. So, unlike nitrogen, it doesn't preferentially choose one of the lattice points, it chooses to sit in between. And I can have vacancies of any of one of these five other species, which you know have the same charge valencies as carbon, but uh, are larger than carbon. Uh, so my vacancy atom marked in yellow over here sits in an interstitial position, which gives its nice <laughs> symmetric property, meaning it's uh, it possesses trigonal symmetry and it's inversion symmetric because the system is you know uh, perfectly balanced between these two vacancy positions and you won't count the charge. Uh, balances uh, it's a spin half system uh, up to what uh, nuclear species you have for the adjacent carbon atoms and what is the nuclear species of the state in Seattle. Uh, the inversion symmetry uh, affords this low susceptibility to electronic perturbation and the symmetry groups will contribute to a level structure that's very well suited to uh, it having good qubit like properties. Where is the yellow atom uh, here? Oh, it's this is a top view. There is no yellow atom in the side view also. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Probably <laughs> uh, some aliasing, <laughs> color aliasing. Yeah. So it's the yellow or red, uh, differently marked atoms than the carbon atoms over here. Uh, so if the generic spectrum of this shows us four principal optical lines that can be probed, and uh, you know, pointing out the group theoretic. Uh, you know, con configurations and what energy values are allowed. Uh, the electronic structure is as follows. You essentially have four fold degenerate states separated into a ground state and an excited state manifold, which due to inherent spin orbit coupling split into two orbital states. And then with additional magnetic fields, you can get Zeeman split states, which are spin result. Uh, of these states, you usually choose these two bottom levels which are spin, uh, spin resolved under a magnetic field to be your qubit levels separated by this delta which is tunable by a magnetic field and you can use the optical transitions to address the system. Uh, the most uh, prominent optical transition is the C transition as shown over here uh, which is an optical coupled level, optically coupled level that's good for a bunch of different protocols that can be uh, you know demonstrated with the system. And uh, for any, uh, let's say any protocol here on, I'm only going to focus on these three systems and ditch this whole level structure. Uh, so spin down, spin up, and spin down track. Or you, know, you can change the downs with ups and it still remains the same. But what stops you in coupling the others? Uh, so this selection uh, <coughs> Yes, so the selection rule uh, prevents transitions other than the four transitions given over here, mm -hmm. and they have to be, uh, they can't be spin flipping transitions. Mm -hmm. uh, these are separated only by microwave frequencies, and these are also susceptible to. But uh, that's optical, no? This is optical. C, D are optical. Yes. So, so you can choose by appropriately choosing your optical execution. Yes, yeah. Uh, the, you can also actually use this level as your down prime level. Some people have done it with non optically addressed systems, usually with phononic drives and whatnot. But uh, I'll show you shortly how the phonon coupling between these two levels actually limits what temperature you can operate these systems at. So, any drive that you do is going to be mixed with your phonon bath, and you actually don't address your system with a pure state. Uh, yeah, so for the different species, people have done experiments over the years. Uh, silicon vacancies have a characteristic wavelength of 737 nanometer. Uh, germanium has something like 602, and TENS has a, a characteristic wavelength of 618.9. And each of them are very good because they're very close to one another. So you can do, and I've been told by experimentalists that you can find good tunable lasers in this range, so they're handy to do experiments with. Uh, but they are operationally challenging to work with because of something known as phonon induced decoherence, which plagues systems like this where the separation here is uh, matched to the thermal phonon path. So, between those uh, lower manifold levels, you have phonon coupling 
going up and down here where the interaction is very similar to a pair of two level systems interacting with a thermal multi mode thermal state bath uh, because of which you have complete uh, you know phonons completely scrambling your phase information over time and you have to essentially operate this system at extremely low temperatures to begin with. Uh, the phonon coupling uh, scale or the phonon coupling is determined by the splitting over here, which increases <coughs> as you increase your uh, vacancy size. So silicon vacancy, for example, this separation is only 50 gigahertz, which means the operating temperature at which you can get any coherence times get even approaching one second is uh, 100 millikelvin. For germanium, it's slightly better, but it's still 400 millikelvin. Uh, for tin, however, you can get to one second of coherence times theoretically with four Kelvin systems. So that's an operation channel with the system that you not only require cryogenics, you require a del fridge for a lot of these vacancies to even do even do like ex basic experiments with let alone networks. Uh, however, given uh, the system and you know the fact that you know over time people have gone from silicon to germanium and now people are focusing on tin, which you can do on a cryostat with optical access other than through fibers. Uh, you can come up with different protocols of how to use the system. Uh, specifically, given that energy uh, level structure that I showed you before and those three levels that we can address, uh, I can think of this as a qubit system that can be driven with a microwave transition and an optical resonance is, can be used uh, to selectively couple these two states, uh, meaning if I have qubit logical levels is down and up, and I only have an optical transition that's allowed by selection rule between down and down prime and not between up and down prime, I can use this to generate entanglement. How do I do that? Uh, well, let's say that I pump the system to its ground state. I then generate superposition by doing a microwave uh, pi pulse, just a Rabi oscillation halfway through it. Uh, if I now choose the system, I, I initialize the system in this equal superposition and I drive it with the optical pulse corresponding to the optical resonance. Only the down state is going to emit a photon, but the up state won't emit a photon. Now I can do a spin flip kit, uh, a pi pulse. Sorry, this has to be a pi by two pulse. My bad. Uh, this is a pi pulse. I do a spin flip uh, either through microwave transition or photon coupled, or you can do an all optical uh, Raman like drive. Uh, my down component becomes the up component, the up component becomes down, and at a later time, if I hit it with an optical pulse, I'll generate a photon only with the component that was up in the first place. So, which component of the state emits a photon is uh, entangled to what time your photon was emitted at. And with some optical delays, you can change this to uh, spin polarization entanglement as well. If I chose to operate in this so single rail photonic basis, a uh, single optical pulse will generate entanglement between spin down presence of a photon and spin up absence of a photon. And this is that is, uh, just as a reminder, this is the kind of resource we needed to do that midpoint swap link. Uh, the other interesting thing that this interaction allows us to do, or this system allows us to do, is achieve uh, something known as the Duan Kimball protocol, which is based on this uh, paper from 2004, where if you have your memory with this specific level structure coupled to a cavity, uh, let's say a single sided cavity and you have a single photon interacting with this system, uh, you can write down using the cavity QED principles what the cavity reflection coefficient must be with respect to the frequency, your coupling rates, uh, your decay rate and your resonant frequencies and whatnot. What you will get is in the resonant over coupled large cooperativity regime uh, where your cooperativity is 4G square over kappa gamma coupling rate G, the gamma G is your cavity coupling rate, kappa is your intrinsic loss rate and gamma is your line with the system. Your reflectivity of the cavity goes to C minus one by C plus one in terms of the cooperativity. So if cooperativity is large, much, much larger than one, if I have a coupled transition, uh, my reflectivity approaches one. And if I have an uncoupled tra transition where cooperativity is zero, my reflectivity becomes minus one. So depending on which state of the spin I'm in, I can impart a phase difference in the photon reflected of the system. And this is used uh, to do a hybrid quantum gate between the 
uh, state of the spin and the state of the photon reflected from the cavity. Uh, so what this essentially does is it allows you to do a teleportation of the incoming photon into the cavity. Uh, how, how do you achieve that? Let's say your incoming photonic state is alpha h plus beta b or alpha 0 1 plus beta 1 0. Now if I build a system where I have a polarizing beam splitter and I say that uh, this beam splitter separates my h and v and I only let the h part uh, interact with the cavity, my v is simply reflected. Uh, my initial joint state is this, uh, nothing has happened and my after interaction joint state my H component is the only thing that picks up a phase in the spin up state and my P component doesn't pick up a phase. Now if I measure the reflected photon in a rotated basis, I can teleport the state of the photon onto the state of the spin with up to an additional phase correction which is dependent on what photon I detect over here. Uh, so you can see that in this process, if the photon, instead of it just being a pure state, was also entangled to another photon on the other end, I can now entangle that unmeasured photon or unreflected photon with the cavity. Meaning, if I had a photonic qubit uh, entanglement between two pair or two qubits and each interacted with the memory, then the state of those photons would be teleported onto the memories, meaning the memories would be entangled to one another, which is what we want to do by a uh, absorption based uh, distribution anyway. So uh, this approach is shown for dual rail uh, polarization encoding, but you can adapt, adapt this to other kind of dual rail encodings as well. Uh, doing it for the single rail encoding, however, is a very hard and open problem that uh, we have been thinking about but haven't found an answer to. Uh, but uh, for polarization encoding, the proposal from my colleagues here is a good one to look at. And for time encoding, this is actually an ex experimental demonstration, actually the first experimental demonstration of quantum memories showing you an advantage for quantum communication. Uh, so, okay, uh, yeah. So how do I then take all of these things and uh, get to actual architecture performances and trade-offs? Uh, we can analyze midpoint swap between distance memories. And in this case, I generically so show this to be a swap based on a satellite, but it being on a satellite and it being on ground doesn't make a difference. I only want to change what my ETAs look like and what uh, they do. Uh, and all of these things I've covered before, but uh, essentially in your single rail case, your square rate is limited by the square root of your loss overall. Uh, you will have uh, certain limitations by using single rail, however, your state quality is limited uh, to the overall loss, where in dual rail up to noise, you can get a perfect state. And the other things are advantages that are given, sorry, uh, the other things that, uh, that are important over here is certain rate scaling advantages that different encodings allows us to do. Uh, I'll skip over these details and just show you some of the results. Uh, so you can take a look at this paper over here uh, for the details of it, but what we were able to do is do a fully uh, parameterized model of swap in the middle protocol and based on these parameters, uh, these five things which are lumped parameters, the channel loss, detection efficiency, excess noise in the channel, mode mismatch, and carrier phase mismatch, we were able to gen generate or we were able to tell you what the quantum state would look like uh, and what the performance would be in terms of its uh, disciplinary entanglement rate, which is the rate of entanglement distribution times the disciplinary entanglement <coughs> rate. And um, the, yes, so the, this, the axis over here is the disciplinary entanglement rate, which is a product of the hashing bound and a probability of successfully swapping over a lossy network. Uh, the performance trade offs. Uh, are uh, you know something that I'll kind of go quickly over is that single rail swaps will scale better uh, over high loss regimes. So this blue and purple line are much higher than the yellow and orange line. I don't know what color it shows on the screen, but just point over here. <laughs> but it's worse at low loss. Your single rail scaling will match the ultimate capacity scaling of O of square root of eta, and any excess noise shown by the dot that dotted and dashed lines over here 
will impose a maximum range of network operation. Uh, your subunity visibility will also influence the best state quality that you can generate. And any carrier phase mismatch only affects uh, your single rail protocols shown by this lone blue line over here and not your dual rail protocol. And any additional uh, hit to visibility of your swap makes your system more prone to loss. Uh, the other protocol that we looked at in a different paper was the midpoint source entanglement distribution where we considered, again, to make it you know uh, fancy, let's say, <laughs> a satellite-based protocol where you had a quantum transmitter with the source on a satellite and quantum receivers with memories loading those photons in that two one gimbal fashion. Again, now your rates are limited to, uh, to eta, uh, which is the total loss in the channel, but your state quality uh, is only limited by how good your quantum memories do in terms of loading those photons, if they can discriminate between noisy photons and not. Uh, the advantages of this is that you can get to a rate scaling and not an exact rate, but a rate scaling of square root of eta when you have low number of memories. And uh, for specifically satellite-based networks, you're sending your photon down rather than going up through the atmosphere, which makes it easier to uh, do mode matching and whatnot. Uh, latencies and memory buffers are not important right now, but uh, the challenges are that nobody has put such a source on a satellite before, so uh, and or even you know deployed it in a ground network. Uh, what the different components of the system corresponds to now are the source that I talked about, the frequency multiplex heralded source, and a set of spin memories configured uh, in a dual Campbell array, meaning you have different cavities through which I have some. Uh, switching network that I can you know, send photons to in a you know, programmable fashion and they can load at different times. Um, what our rate calculation showed that was that if I do limit how many photons I have, or sorry, how many memories I have, my rate scaling indeed goes to square root of eta scaling as uh, my number of uh, memories is limited. Uh, this is just a scaling. This is uh, a normalized rate. Uh, this this blue line would be much much lower than the red line if I did not normalize it. But in the uh, high memory uh, regime, I don't have my square root of eta scaling. Uh, this is you know a peculiarity. It's not a feature. It's just something interesting to look at. Uh, and what we can show is that. If I now did a head-on comparison with what would happen if I use my spectrally multiplex heralded source, which we call zero added loss multiplexing or ZOM over here, uh, versus an SPDC source, I see that given and you know how many other spins I wanted to have, and uh, comparing what the achievable entanglement generation rate is, SPDC peaks out to some theoretical gap much much earlier than how how much I could do with the multiplex source because the SPDC can only be driven at a certain, uh, you know, input power, so to speak. Uh, anything else is uh, going to give us noise, so to achieve a fidelity or here marked as infidelity epsilon over here, I cannot drive it super hard. So all that given, uh, I think the last things I quickly wanted to talk about was we are interested in doing modular quantum communication link simulations, and this was just kind of a small, sneak peek of how these things look like. Why? Because uh, as I've shown you, quantum communication links are not trivial to evaluate and compare, and people use different siloed terminology that makes uh, getting to different solutions hard. Uh, there's a lot of the desired things that uh, not everybody cares about, but must be you know, achieved for a most general simulator. And the pre-existing simulators uh, tend to do these things in a fashion that suits their uh, applications very well, but they're well established. The most famous ones being NetSquid, which is a discrete event-based pl platform for network level studies, and something called Sequence from Chicago, which also does network resource management and whatnot. Uh, our focus on this has been to do full, uh, you know, bottom to up simulations. Uh, the most mature of this is something called the quantum safety package on the open source Julia language coming out of the cross of group in UMass Amherst. It takes uh, the most general model for noisy quantum communication and then does uh, discrete human simulation on it. And complementarily, uh, and at Tucson, 
uh, at our university, we have been coming up with our own simulator, which we call Cactus, uh, which is going to be supported by the theoretical models I gave you a glimpse of, and informed by experimental network design at our testbed to do it. Uh, Quantum Savory is open source. You can go to this documentation, and Stefan, uh, whose group it is, uh, has done a great job at maintaining you know, almost production code quality documentation. It's almost like you know, using something from a software company. Uh, we are still in testing, but we'll have a limited release soon. So if you want to you know, get quick access to it, let me know. But for a sneak peek, we already have some of the code available. At, I'll link to my GitHub if you want to go and check it out. Uh, so yeah, uh, wanted to acknowledge, of course, Professor Saifat Guha, who's my advisor, uh, Professor Dirk England and his student, uh, Dr. Kevin Chen, who have you know, given me a lot of insights into quantum memory theory development and also experiments, and also uh, for our collaboration on experimental link simulations, Professor Matt Eichenfield and Dr. Shahan Sui, who have been uh, instrumental in the Tucson testbed and simulator development, giving me guidance on how to do this, and uh, finally our collaborators who have helped us with entanglement source modeling and link simulation, Professor Paul Quirat and his student Spencer Johnson. So yeah, with that, uh, I thank you all, and uh, any questions? Any questions? I have to rush, but no more questions. Ask thanks, Rajiv, for the talk. And there's something for you, but I have to give. Thank you, Rush. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, good teacher. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to come and discuss. I just need to pick up my bag. Okay. Sure. Uh, I can leave it. No, 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 no. Uh, don't.